the founder and CEO of the Evanina Group. And in many ways, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, um, he's, he's worked on with this members of this committee on for many, many years. Anna Pugli Puglisi, sorry, Anna, um, Senior Fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, at Georgetown University. And on WebEx, Matt Pottinger, uh, the Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institute and former Deputy National Advisor, uh, Deputy National Security Advisor, I think, at the White House. Today, the committee will examine the counterintelligence threats posed by the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party. We will look at the PRC's activities within the United States as it works to acquire critical U.S. technologies and intellectual property, hack into the U.S. cyber networks, and conduct influence operations to shape narratives to be more favorable to the PRC and the CCP. I hope the witnesses will also discuss their recommendations for better countering the CCP's efforts in the United States. Now, the Intelligence Committee, as Senator Burr often reminded us, doesn't normally hold open hearings, but Vice Chairman Rubio and I believe this story needs to get out to the American public. Several years ago, the committee, in a bipartisan way, thanks in part to Senators Rubio, Burr, Cornyn, and Collins, convened a series of classified sessions with leaders from the intelligence community and leaders from the private sector, tech, finance, venture capital, academia, to brief them on efforts by the CCP to target their industries. I've wanted for some time to take those briefs and move them into an open hearing so that the U.S. public, including the private sector, our academic institutions, our media outlets, and others can better understand these threats and how we, as a society, can counter them. Because the truth is, the government cannot counter the CCP's actions all by itself. One of the most important areas that I hope the witnesses will address is how China is focusing on targeting key U.S. technologies for both acquisition and development. These include aerospace, advanced manufacturing, AI, biotech, data analytics, semiconductors, renewables, all in order to ensure PRC's future dominance in these areas. We saw this play out in many ways, and again, I think this committee was one of the first to notice the CCP's efforts in their pursuit of 5G technology with backing of Huawei. And I'm proud that this committee's work in sounding the alarm on the threat of what would happen if networks all around were reliant on a sole source Chinese provider in 5G. That would threaten both our national security and our allies' security. I hope the witnesses will also address how the CCP is using a variety of methods to acquire these capabilities, including cyber and traditional espionage, but also using a lot of the tools of business, joint ventures, acquisitions, mergers, and increasingly strategic investments by firms that at the end of the day are answerable to the Communist Party leadership in Beijing. They're also creating a series of partnerships with universities in many ways, oftentimes luring some of those universities into trips or sinecures that sometimes put that academic research at risk. We also know increasingly we're seeing their malign influence efforts to affect policy decisions that we in the Congress make. Matter of fact, the FBI has estimated that China's theft of intellectual, of simply American intellectual property, not worldwide, just American intellectual property, runs from between 300 to $600 billion a year. According to the DOJ, 80% of all economic espionage prosecutions brought by the DOJ allege conduct that would benefit the Chinese state. And 60% of all trade secret theft cases have some nexus to China. FBI Director Ray told this committee in April that the Bureau has more than 2,000 operations going on, investigations, that tie back to the Chinese government. And this is one of the most stunning facts he laid out. He opens up a new investigation into Chinese espionage 
every 10 hours. The director also attested that no other country represents more of a threat to the United States, its economic security, and democratic ideals than China. And that China's ability to influence American institutions is, quote, deep, wide, and persistent. Seeding leadership across these technology sectors would have major repercussions for U.S. economic and national security. Let's not forget that in most ways, since World War II, the United States has led in both scientific research and the development of transformational technologies. It's this leadership that has translated into decades of economic success for U.S. companies and our military capabilities. As part of our technological leadership, the U.S., or like-minded democracies, also set the global standards and protocols for new technology. And many of the times, we can implant in those standards, in those protocols, our values. Democracy, transparency, diversity of opinion, and respect for human rights. And that is a long-term value to our country that I don't think is often factored in. I've been frustrated, though, by the frequency by which U.S. companies, in their desire for market access in China, have frankly given up sometimes on those values and sometimes facilitated and enabled the PRC to acquire sensitive U.S. technologies. The idea they can't miss the Chinese market means they make sacrifices going into that market they would make in no other nation in the world. China, in turn, uses these technologies to advance its own illiberal vision to surveil and control its population, stifle the free flow of information, and repress foreign influence ca campaigns worldwide. These technologies enable the PRC to suppress dissident and re restrict religious groups. We see that whether it's in Xinjiang or in Hong Kong. As we think through what the CCP is doing in the United States, I want to make crystal clear, though, my concerns lie squarely with the president of China, Xi Jinping, and the Chinese Communist Party leaders, not the people of China, and certainly not with Chinese or other Asian Americans who have contributed so much to our society. Our answer to these challenges cannot be to keep talented folks out of the United States. In fact, we've seen in my state of, of Virginia, Northern Virginia particularly, a technology hotbed Literally 40% of all the startups are started by first-generation Americans. So it is in our national interest to welcome these talented Chinese academics, entrepreneurs, and technologists. And in fact, make it more attractive for them to use their talent to bolster our economy, rather than simply going back to China. This is, again, where our values come into play. And Americans should also be aware that the PRC's pressures and coercion efforts don't stop with the diaspora or Chinese nationals living in the United States. As Senator Rubio will point out, increasingly, the CCP is focused on pressuring U.S. citizens, entities, and businesses across industries to, again, shape a narrative that advances their goals. Even for this hearing, a number of potential witnesses declined to participate in an open format for fear of retribution to themselves or their families. From the PRC's pursuit of critical and sensitive technology to its repression at home and coercion abroad and its focus on trying to win the technology battle in the 21st century, it's clear that I think our country is facing a new Sputnik moment where we must take steps to remain competitive, especially in technology, and find better ways to strengthen our defenses against the CCP's myriad intelligence, tech acquisition, and foreign influence operations. Because we're back into this kind of semi-hybrid system today, for today's meeting, we will be asking questions by order of seniority, and as Senator King has made clear, with the five-minute rule applying. Thank you. I now turn to the Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. <clears throat> I think you started out by talking about how unusual it is we have these open hearings, and there's a reason for it. Um, the members of this committee, on a regular basis, review some of the most... Uh, sensitive intelligence, both intelligence and the products that come from them that this government has available to it. So I think it should send a powerful message um, when you see that on issue after issue relating uh, to China, issues that some would argue are outside the purview of what this committee has traditionally looked at, technology, 
academia, uh, influence operations, global diplomacy, um, industrial policy, that it is members of this committee that you see in the lead on so many issues relating to China. Uh, because the members of this committee have a, because of the role they play, have a very unique insight into this horror show that's playing out before our eyes in the 21st century. The, the, the title of this hearing is The Long Arm of China. The Long Arm of China is not some futuristic threat. It's already here. China is stealing between 300 and 600 billion dollars a year. Three to 600 billion dollars a year of American technology and intellectual property. They hack into networks and they take it. They use venture capital funds to, to buy promising technology startups. They hide their, their ownership, by the way. They partner with universities on research, and then they steal that research, often research that whose seed funding came from the U.S. taxpayer. They, they force American companies doing business in China to give the technology over to them. And I think the other thing most people don't realize is China already, already has tremendous influence and control over what Americans are allowed to say or hear about them or many of the other issues in the world. Hollywood is so desperate, for example, to have their movies shown in China that Hollywood won't make a movie that the China communist censors don't approve. The U.S. corporations are so desperate to have access to the Chinese market that they'll lead costly boycotts of a state, an American state, that passes a law that they don't like, but, but they don't dare say a word about the fact that as we speak, genocide is taking place against Uyghur Muslims. American companies have actually fired Americans who live in America for saying or writing something that, that China doesn't like. There's some examples here that are pretty stunning. 2019, China suspended business ties with the NBA because the general manager of the Houston Rockets expressed support for Hong Kong democracy protests. 2019, Apple removed an app that enabled protesters in Hong Kong to organize following CCP pressure. In 2019, an American company, Activision Blizzard, suspended a gamer and took away his prize money for voicing support for Hong Kong protesters. In 2018, Marriott, the, fired a, a, an employee that ran a social media account because he liked a Twitter post from a Twitter account applauding Marriott for listing Tibet as a country rather than as part of China, and he was fired after that. 2018 Gap. Gap made a shirt uh, with a map of China, and it didn't include Taiwan. They apologized for it, and they removed the shirt from its stores. Now, maybe you think that shirt thing is trivial. I don't think people getting fired is trivial, apps getting trivial, these other things. These are just one of a handful of many. And this is already happening. So um, in conclusion, I'd say two things. The first is chairman is absolutely right. This is not about the Chinese people, or especially not about Chinese Americans, OK? My parents came from Cuba. I live in a community filled with Cuban Americans. It would be unfair to blame Cuban Americans for the atrocities of the Cuban regime. And it would most certainly be unfair to blame the Cuban people for the horrifying actions uh, of, of the uh, regime that controls that enslaved island. Likewise, the biggest opponents of the Chinese Communist Party on the planet happen to be Chinese. Many live here, many in other parts of the world, and many under their oppressive thumb. So this is not about the, China, the Chinese people. It is about a Communist Party, and it is time to wake up. Today, China is already carrying out the biggest illegal wealth transfer from one nation to another in the history of mankind. Today, the Chinese Communist Party has more control over what Americans can say, what we can hear, what we can read, what we can watch, than any foreign government has ever had in our history. And they have weaponized our openness. They have weaponized our decency. And they have weaponized a corporate lust for profits against us. And if we don't wake up and we don't address this now, the America our children are going to inherit very soon could very well be one where the sanctimonious preachings, as someone once said, the sanctimonious preachings of a genocidal communist tyranny will be the only thing that Americans will be allowed to hear or say about China. So I'm glad we're having this hearing. And Mr. Chairman, just as a point of privilege here, um, one of our longtime staffers, today's his last hearing with us, Paul Matulik, he's been with the committee, he's been 16 years, worked with Senators Hatch and Chambliss and Burr and Cornyn and, and now here with us. And um, so he's retiring. and. Um, we hope, as all retirees should, he's moving to Florida. We don't know, but, um, but it's, that's what Americans do. And, uh, but anyway, we want to thank him for his service to the committee, and uh, we hope our last hearing will be a memorable one.
but thank you for your service. Let me let me echo that, and this was um, a subject of uh, quite a bit of focus yesterday in our closed hearing, where he we went into some of Paul's um, behavior and linguistic abilities. Um, luckily, that will stay classified, but uh, we all very much value Paul's work, and again, want to commend him in particular for he and the whole team, but their relentless pursuit of the truth in the Russia investigation. With that, we, we turn to our witnesses, and I'm not sure Anna, Bill, or Matt on WebEx, who's gonna go first, but uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chairman Warner, Vice Chairman Rubio, members of the committee. It's an honor to be here before you today. I've humbly briefed this committee on a regular basis for more than a decade as the Director of National Counterintelligence and Security Center and as a senior executive of the FBI and CIA. I was tremendously honored last year to be the first Senate-confirmed director of NCIC, leading our nation's counterintelligence efforts, and I must specifically thank this committee for your support. I'm here today before you as a private citizen. Today's topic, the holistic and comprehensive threat to the United States posed by the Communist Party of China, is an existential threat, and is the most complex, pernicious, aggressive, and strategic threat our nation has ever faced. I proffer that the U.S. private sector and academia have become the geopolitical battle space for China. Xi Jinping has one goal, to be the geopolitical, military, and economic leader in the world, period. He, along with China's Ministry of State Security, People's Liberation Army, and the United Front Work Department, drive a comprehensive and whole-of-country approach to their efforts to invest, leverage, infiltrate, influence, and steal from every corner of the United States. This is a generational battle for Xi and the Communist Party. It drives their every decision. So why does it matter? Because economic security is national security. Our economic global supremacy, stability, and long-term vitality is at risk, and squarely in the crosshairs of Xi Jinping and the Communist regime. It is estimated that 8% of American adults have had all of their personal data stolen by the Communist Party of China. The other 20%, just some of the data. As the chairman and vice chairman already met, referenced, the e estimated economic loss last year from the country of China, just from known intellectual property and trade secret loss, is between $300 and $600 billion a year. It's a big number. What that means, it's between $4,000 and $6,000 per American family of four after taxes. Competition is great and necessary, and it is what made America the global leader we are today. However, I would proffer China's economic growth the past decade via any and all means is considerably less than fair competition. My question is, are we really competing? If we do not alter how we compete with awareness of China's blind methodology and one-sided practices, we will not sustain our global position as the world leaders from tomorrow's emerging technology down to our creative ideations. We must create a robust public-private partnership with real intelligence sharing, while at the same time staying true to the values, values morals, and rule of law which made America the greatest country in the world. This will take a whole-of-nation approach with a mutual fund analogous long-term commitment. Such an approach must start with a contextual awareness campaign reaching a broad audience from every level of government to university campuses and from boardrooms to business schools. The why matters. As an example, Huawei is a national security threat to the United States. This committee is aware of that. But we do not effectively explain to America why. U.S. boards and directors and investment leaders must begin to look beyond next fiscal quarterly earnings call and begin to think strategically about how their investment decisions and unawareness of the long-term threat can impact their businesses and industries, as well as America's economic and national security. From a cybersecurity perspective, China possesses persistent and unending resources to penetrate our systems and exfiltrate our data or sit dormant and wait, or plant malware on a critical infrastructure for future hostilities. 
At the same time, the insider threat epidemic originating from the Communist Party of China has been nothing short of devastating to the United States corporate world. Additionally, the Communist Party of China strategically conducts malign influence campaigns at the state and local level of the United States with precision. These efforts must be exposed and mitigated. To effectively defend against China and compete effectively, we must put the same effort into this threat as we did to combat terrors in the past 20 years. I would suggest the threat posed by the Communist Party of China is much more dangerous to our economic and military viability as a nation. In conclusion, I would like to state for the record, and as the Chairman and Vice Chairman mentioned, the significant national security threat we face from the Communist Party of China is not a threat posed by the Chinese people or as individuals. Chinese nationals or any Chinese person or Chinese ethnicity here in the United States or around the world are not a threat and should not be racially targeted in any matter whatsoever. This is a threat pertaining to a draconian communist country with an autocratic dictator who is committed to human rights violations and stopping at nothing to achieve his geopolitical goals. Thank you for this opportunity to be here with you today, and I look forward to dialogue with my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anna? Thank you. Uh, Chairman Warner, Ranking Member Rubio, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The issues we are going to discuss will make us uncomfortable because they touch on the core beliefs and assumptions we make as Americans regarding democracy, opportunity, capitalism, open markets, and the importance and role of immigrants throughout the history of the US. My own grandparents were immigrants who came here to this country with little formal education, worked menial jobs, and made a new life for themselves. My presence here today is a testament to the American dream. I want to start with saying that there's no room for xenophobia or ethnic profiling in the US. It goes against everything we have stood for as a nation. And precisely because of these values, we need to find a principled way forward. The issues should not be seen as concerns of one administration or the policies of one political party, but as the challenges created by a nation state that is ever more authoritarian and that has a different system, a different regard for human rights, and a different view of competition and fairness. Since you have my written testimony, I will focus my remarks on some of the highlights. China is engaged in a strategic rivalry with the US centered on economic power. China's management of its relationship with the US has been designed to mask key aspects of this rivalry. This is why it's so difficult to have these conversations. Beijing, in many ways, understands the societal tensions and its statecraft is directed at them, exploiting identity politics and promoting any changes to US policy as ethnic profiling. Extreme positions, such as closing our eyes or closing the doors, only benefits China. So now let's take a moment and talk about what's at stake. United States science and technology dominance since World War II has underpinned US national strength and soft power. Losing our technological edge and the influence it entails will have far reaching implications beyond scientific disciplines. This is not only about military technologies. Future strength will be built on 5G, AI, and biotechnology. And our systems are fundamentally not the same. China's central government policies and the role of the state create this different system. These include talent programs that exploit its diaspora, s and development programs with acquisition strategies built into them, and China's policy on civil military fusion. Let me be clear. China says it will use any knowledge or technology it acquires for its military. This is not conjuncture or profiling or analysis, but stated China's stated position, and I would add for decades, we should believe them. Given the scope and scale of China's activities, a reevaluation of our underlying assumptions and how we evaluate risk will be essential to counter these efforts. Therefore, I have the following recommendations. First, we really do need to improve ourselves. The US and other liberal democracies must invest in the future. And we also have to realize that not all discovery has immediate commercial application. We need to focus on things that provide the highest value to the nation instead of just the lowest cost. We must build research security into future funding programs. We also need to face the facts as a society. 
Beijing doesn't play by fair market rules. It does not respect foreign intellectual property. It is willing to act directly and indirectly to ensure its favored companies win in the market. The result of this is that our companies and our researchers are not competing on an equal and level playing field, but instead are up against the strategy, and I would add the power and the money of a nation state. We must increase transparency. Existing policies and laws are insufficient to address the level of influence the Chinese Communist Party exerts in our society, especially in academia. We must increase reporting requirements for foreign money at our academic and research institutes, and university government labs and research institutions should have clear reporting requirements and rules on the participation of foreign talent programs. And that part really needs to be, be country agnostic. We need to ensure true reciprocity. This is about fairness and market access. We can no longer allow China to weaponize its market. Connecting China's reciprocity and sharing of scientific data to its access to US institutions and big science facilities is a leverage point. For too long, we have looked the other way when China has not followed through on the details of its agreements that it has entered into. We also need to bolster cooperation and the communication of risk with our allies and partners. What also makes these conversations difficult, and as my colleague has alluded to, is that the reality that China is presenting is inconvenient to those that are benefiting in the short term. This includes companies looking for short-term profits, academics that benefit personally from funding and cheap labor in their laboratories, and former government officials who cash in as lobbyists for China, state-owned and state-supported companies. We need to move beyond tactical solutions and have a comprehensive strategy for how we deal with China. So I would like to thank the committee once again for continuing to discuss this issue. These are hard conversations that we as a nation must have if we are gonna protect and promote US competitiveness, future developments, and our values. If we do not highlight and address China's policies that violate global norms and our values, we give credence to a system that undermines fairness, openness, and human rights. The Chinese people deserve better, the US people deserve better, and I think our future really depends on it. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And now I think we're gonna hear from WebEx, on WebEx, uh, Matt Pottinger. Great, uh, thumbs up if you can hear me. We can hear you Terrific. but not see you. Oh, there you are, now we can do both. Great, well, Chairman Warner and uh, Vice Chairman Rubio, thank you and your fellow committee members for hosting a public hearing uh, on this very important topic. I, you know, many Americans were slow to realize it, but Beijing's enmity for the United States really began decades ago. Uh, ever since the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP came into power in 1949, it's cast the United States as an antagonist. And then three decades ago, at the end of the Cold War, Beijing quietly revised its grand strategy to regard Washington as its primary external adversary and it embarked on a quest for regional followed by global dominance. So the United States and other free societies have belatedly woken up to this contest, and there's a, a welcome spirit of bipartisanship that's emerged on Capitol Hill. But even with this new consensus, um, we, we've, we failed to adequately appreciate, I think, one of the most threatening elements of Chinese strategy, and that's the way that it seeks to influence and coerce Americans including political, business, and scientific leaders in the service of Beijing's ambitions. So the CCP's manifest, uh, methods are really a manifestation of uh, political warfare, which is the term that George Kennan, the, the chief architect of our Cold War strategy of containment, used in a 1948 memo to describe the employment of all of the means at a nation's command short of war to achieve its national objectives. So that's what China's doing. And one of the most crucial elements of Beijing's political warfare is its so-called United Front work. So United Front work is an immense range of activities with no analog in democracies. Uh, China's leaders call it a magic weapon, and the, the CCP's 95 million members are all required to participate in the system, which has many different branches. The, the United Front work department alone, which is just one branch, has three times as many cadres as the US State Department has foreign service officers, except instead of pra practicing diplomacy, the United Front gathers intelligence about and works to influence private citizens, as well as government officials overseas, 
with a focus on foreign elites and the organizations they run, including businesses that you and Senator Rubio just, just mentioned. Um, Peter Mattis, who detailed uh, how United Front Work is organized during his 2019 testimony before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence said, put simply, United Front Work is conducted wherever the party is present. And the party is quite present here in the United States. So assembling dossiers on people has always been a feature of Leninist regimes, but Beijing's penetration of digital networks worldwide, including using 5G networks that you referenced, uh, Chairman Warner, uh, has really taken this to a new level. So the, the party now compiles dossiers on millions of foreign citizens around the world, using the material that it gathers to influence and target and intimidate, reward, blackmail, flatter and humiliate, and ultimately divide and conquer. So it, it, Bill Evanina's uh, written testimony today makes plain that Beijing has stolen sensitive data sufficient to build a dossier on every single American adult and on many of our children too, who are fair game under Beijing's rules of political warfare. So newer to the Communist Party's arsenal is the exploitation of US social media platforms. So over the past few years, Beijing has flooded US platforms with overt and covert propaganda amplified by proxies and bots. And the propaganda is focused not only on promoting whitewash narratives of Beijing's policies, but also increasingly on exacerbating social tensions within the United States and other target nations. Uh, the, the Chinese government and its online proxies, for example, have for months promoted content that questions the effectiveness and safety of our Western-made COVID-19 vaccines. There's been some recent research by the Sufan Center that also found indications that China-based influence operations online are now outpacing Russian efforts to amplify some conspiracy theories. So what are some of the things that Washington can do to address Beijing's political warfare? First, uh, I think we should stop funding technologies in China that are used to advance the, the surveillance state and the military of, of Beijing. So Beijing's turning facial recognition, 5G, data mining, machine learning technologies and others, not only against their own citizens, but increasingly against Americans here at home. So the executive orders that were issued by the Trump and Biden administrations that prohibit the US purchase of stocks and bonds in 59 named Chinese companies is a good start. But the Treasury Department really needs to expand that list by orders of magnitude in order to better encompass the galaxy of Chinese companies that are developing these so-called dual-use technologies. Congress should also look at revising the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA, uh, to include more robust reporting requirements, steeper penalties for non-compliance, and a publicly accessible database of FARA registrants and their activities that's updated regularly. Um, the United States can also do more to expose and confront Beijing's information warfare uh, through uh, our social media platforms. Remember, these are platforms that are themselves banned inside of China's own borders. So U.S. social media companies have the technological know-how and resources to take a leading role in exposing and tamping down shadowy influence operations uh, online. And the U.S. government should partner more closely with Silicon Valley uh, companies in this work. Uh, Washington should, should also uh, partner with U.S. technology giants to make it easier for the Chinese people to safely access access and exchange news, opinions, history, films, and satire with their fellow citizens and other people who are outside of China's great firewall. Finally, we should do more to protect Chinese students and other Chinese nationals living here in the United States. Many people of Chinese descent, including some US permanent residents and even US citizens live in fear that their family members back in China will be detained or otherwise punished for what their American relatives say or do here in the United States. And this kind of coercion by Beijing, among other things, has silenced countless Chinese language news outlets around the world. Uh, so much so that, that there's almost no private Chinese language news outlet left uh, in the United States or abroad that doesn't tow the Communist Party line. Uh, the US government can help by offering grants to promising private outlets and also re-energizing uh, some of the federally funded media such as Radio Free Asia. Uh, and U.S. universities, maybe with help from the U.S. government, should also hand a second smartphone to every Chinese national who comes to study in our schools in the United States so that they have a smartphone that is free from Chinese apps such as WeChat, which monitor users' activities and censor their news feeds. Thanks very much. Well, again, I want to thank all three of the um, 
uh, our witnesses this today and again for late arriving members. Um, we're going to go by traditional seniority in five-minute rounds. I also very much appreciate um, all three of you making the point that our beef is with the CCP and its leadership and not the Chinese people and surely not uh, the Chinese diaspora, Ch Chinese Americans, and that um, there is no place for racist, racist or xenophobic targeting in, in our country, um, and that in many ways would simply play into the hands of the CCP. Let me start. I was going to start with a question different than I was um, originally going to start with, which is something that we're current taking place. As we know, or maybe I'm not sure most Americans know, that in roughly 2015, 2016, China changed its, in a sense, corporate legal framework to make explicitly clear that any Chinese company's first obligation was not to its shareholders or even its employees, but its first obligation was to the Communist Party. Coincident with that same time, we have seen an emergence, oftentimes driven, as Bill pointed out, by intellectual property theft. But we've seen an emergence of Chinese, particularly social media, delivery, other companies that have had some of the biggest returns of any companies in the world over the last few years, the Alibabas, the Badus, the Tencents. What I'm not sure most folks have realized is that those companies and many others the vast majority of their investors are either American or Westerners. Something unique has happened, though, in the, starting with um, Jack Ma and Ant when they tried to go, go public um, a number of months back, and the government intervened and stopped that enterprise from going public. A number of other companies have now been cracked, Chinese tech companies have now been cracked down upon. Um, you know, is this an ability to try to get their large tech companies under control the same way we're having that active debate in this country? Is it, in a sense, a warning shot across the bow for those companies that have potentially been trying to go public either here in the United States or on the Hong Kong exchange as opposed to inside the PRC? Or is it even a possibility that this is an effort, since these companies are not going away, to wash out those Western and American investors, because we've seen the values of these companies in some cases decrease by 50% literally over the last 60 to 90 days, um, and then to have them in a sense refinanced with, a, uh, with Chinese funds themselves with more compliant tech leadership. And I throw that out to all three of the members of the panel for comments. Senator, I... I, I Thank you very much for the for that question and, and those points. You know, I, I think you're exactly right that what you're seeing now is a uh, a deliberate obliteration of the line. Certainly a blurring, but ultimately an obliteration of the line between private companies on the one hand and state-owned companies on the other in in China. Uh, on, uh, an obliteration of the line separating civilian uh, companies on the one hand. Uh, and and military uh, companies and institutions on the other, and even a blurring of the line between foreign invested uh, companies, uh, you know, multinational companies, so to speak, and and domestic Chinese state champions. Uh, Beijing's goal is to reconcentrate the, the authority of of uh, the party um, uh, over all of the economic life, uh, of, of Beijing. And that's really, this is about much more than just wanting to assert control over data. Although that's one of the, the, the other reasons that Beijing has been taking these steps against Alibaba and Didi and many, many others to come. Um, you know, the, uh, there, there are a number of laws that force that those functions that you reference, and I'd be happy to provide a, a, a uh, sort of a, an index of some of those some of those laws that require companies in China, including foreign joint ventures, to uh, first and foremost uh, serve the national security uh, interests of the, of, the, of the party, to serve the party's broader interests, and to work uh, at the behest of the security apparatus uh, to do that. So corporate governance in China um, is, is not what is represented in um, public filings to 
you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission. I, I, I've been waiting, uh, uh, turning purple, holding my breath, waiting for the Securities and Exchange Commission to begin asserting its authority to, to uh, actually recognize that the risk factors are not even remotely adequately addressed in the public filings of, of Chinese companies here in the United Matt, States. Matt, could I cut you off there? Because I want to make sure I'm going to try to adhere to my time and I want to see if uh, Anna or Bill have another comment on this topic as well. Sir, Senator, just uh, two foot stomps from your, from your point and to maybe amplify what Matt had mentioned. Uh, for, specifically for uh, corporate America, there, the three laws that China uh, initiated, two national security laws and one cyber law, I think are critical for CEOs and investment folks in the United States to understand. Most importantly is from a technological perspective that every CISO and CIO in China mm -hmm. or Chinese company in China or abroad is mandated to provide third-party data to the intelligence organizations in China. So if you are a U.S. company and you're partnering with a company in China, you have to be aware that all, any and all your data will be provided to the intelligence services in China. That's number one. Secondly, to your point, 13 of the 15 largest companies in China are state-owned or operated. There's only two left. Alibaba is one of the two left. And we see what's happening to them now overseas in China with the draconian efforts that Xi is employing. So I just want to foot stomp on the, the laws, and that's something that we can provide to the, uh, to the committee. Um, but in some ways, you know, to take a lighter att attempt, this is, they've actually said the quiet part out loud in seeing what's happening to these companies, because this actually is a really good demonstration how, how different the systems are. I would point out, and before I move to the vice chairman, we had 13 of what we call our classified roadshows. Every industry, Virtually every major college and university in America participated in one or more of those, with the exception of private equity. The very private equity that funded some of these Chinese tech companies that are now getting absolutely creamed as the Chinese government reasserts control. Maybe they would have been better to take advantage of our repeated offers to meet with private equity in a classified setting so they understood perhaps better what they were getting themselves into. Uh, so I'm not shedding a lot of tears for some of their losses, but I do hope uh, on a going forward basis, uh, they and others will continue to make sure that um, uh, they go in with eyes wide open in terms of dealing with the PRC. With that, Senator Ruby. Thank you, Mr. Pottinger, let me start with you. <clears throat> Did China try to manipulate public opinion in the United States and around the world during the early days of, of the COVID pandemic? Senator Rubio, uh, certainly we saw all sorts of activity um, by Beijing, uh, overt propaganda as well as um, uh, what I would call um, more shadowy schemes uh, to, to, to uh, influence and amplify messages that in many cases are disguised to appear as though they are uh, organic discourse between private citizens, but are really very carefully and well-resourced uh, campaigns, um, uh, uh, you know, orchestrated by Chinese propaganda officials. Now, uh, some of some of the, you're referencing the time that early in the COVID uh, epidemic. Uh, some of the ones I can just think of off the top of my head were uh, efforts to um, uh, uh, create um, uh, doubt about the origins uh, of this pandemic. In, in fact. To claim that uh, that the pandemic originated from uh, the U.S. military, um, uh, we we saw uh, efforts to undermine, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the credibility of our vaccines. Uh, certainly, quite a lot of uh, propaganda, both overt and covert, designed to um, uh, create um, distrust and 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 uh, you know a lack of faith in democracy as a whole and to amp up and, and uh, elevate the idea of, of uh, Leninist totalitarianism as, as a somehow superior model um, in, in spite of what the record uh, has been uh, over the decades that the Chinese Communist Party has been in power. I'm thinking of the, the tens of millions of deaths of its own citizens uh, from mismanagement from their, their, uh, their government. So uh, the short answer is yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Puglisi, uh, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center warned, I think, in February that uh, China's collecting the medical data, the DNA, and the genomic data of Americans. 
why do they want the DNA and genomic information of Americans? So China has amassed the largest um, genomic holdings of anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the most important questions in the next generation of both medicine and also uh, biological research is the genotype to phenotype. So understanding what genes do. And so access to that kind of data, um, both their own and from other places in the world, gives them an advantage in, in figuring out some of those problems. And we know from their central government policies and programs, they have emphasized the importance of um, next generation medicine, um, and that is a huge focus for them. Meaning the designing of precision medicine that allows curing specific conditions in people with specific genetic makeups. Yes. Mr. Avenina, how, in your opinion, how confident is China in their ability to get American banks, American investment firms, and American big business, how, how confident are they in their ability to get these to act as their lobbyists here in Washington? Uh, Senator Rubin, there's no lack of confidence. I, I don't believe the, the Communist Party of China has any reticence to believe they can't acquire whatever they want to acquire. And you see currently now with the new movement of the Communist Party of China investing into pension funds, both at the state and local level as well as into our thrift savings plan federally. They do it in a sublime manner, sometimes shrouded in U.S. business investment and shrouded with a third uh, party fund companies to be able to get and garner their uh, corner, their market, so to speak, in our investment fund. So they have no lack of confidence in acquiring anything they need in our financial services sector. No, what, I, what I'm, and that's for sure, and, but I think the question was how confident are they in their ability to get an American company, for example, or a finance sector or what have you, to use the lure of access to the Chinese marketplace to get them to come back to Washington and lobby policymakers here against or for decisions that China favors. In essence, they deputize them to come back and say, don't do this or don't do that. Um, th their ability to turn these American entities into lobbyists for their preferred policy outcome in our policies. Again, there's no lack of confidence, and we've seen that occur in other parts of Chinese lobbying here in DC, hiring former members of Congress, former members of the administration, former members of large banks to be able to come back and lobby and explain China's methodology and their narrative as to why their funding uh, is more important than any funding here. And I will reiterate uh, Senator Warner's point that some of my activities subsequent to retirement, the private equity and venture capital folks are saying they're getting 30% ROI from investments in China. Yeah, and so, so just, just real quick tied to that, do, do you, are they forward thinking enough to look at a state legislator, a mayor, a commissioner at the local level and say that person may one day be a member of Congress, let's start working them now, get close to them, and have them adopt our favorite narrative of China so that in the future when they wind up in that position, they'll be more favorable to our views. Absolutely, and it's a common practice. I would point out that uh, I want to note that Senator Cornyn and Senator Feinstein did some very good work that all of us on the committee supported on trying to strengthen some of those uh, restrictions on on that foreign investment with the CFIUS Act. Senator, Senator White. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, to all our panelists. Um, I'm of the view that data is one of the most underappreciated threats to America's national security. And that is especially true when you're talking about Americans' data being exported to our adversaries. And it's already the case that the Chinese government or hackers based in China have stolen the personal information of hundreds of millions of Americans. As a result, I have been pushing hard to enact a law that would ensure that Americans' most private data cannot be sold off in bulk to countries that it would use it against us. So my question to you is I want to pick up on one of the earlier questions one of my colleagues just asked about uh, with respect to genetic uh, data, and because of the importance of this issue, Mr. Ivanina, I know you've spent a lot of time on this. How does the Chinese government actually obtain the genetic information of Americans? And tell us, for the record, why that's so dangerous to national security. Thank you, Senator Wyden. I think there's a couple aspects to this uh, question. First is to Footstop your message of China's demand for data. 
When we look at what they've accumulated in the last decade, I'll point to Equifax, 150 million Americans, all their financial data has been taken by China. I will say that um, it's unnecessary for China to procure or buy our data when they can come in and take it for free uh, because of our lack of cybersecurity defenses here. Uh, provide an open door for them to take through spear phishing other, other vectors to get into our systems and take our data. With respect to DNA and, and, and genomics, uh, they'll use front companies like BGI, which is a company around the world, to set up stations to collect COVID samples and do fertility clinics. And every single time you do that, uh, you're giving away all your data to that node of that company, which, as we said before, is now beholden to Communist Party. So as you provide genetics, blood typing, or any kind of COVID test, it's going to possibly go uh, to the Chinese Communist Party, which is why we must protect what we do here on our soil from companies like Quest and other diagnostic companies, which are in every single town, from being procured by the Chinese government. I'm, I'm going to also hold the record open because I feel so strongly about this. For any additional information you could give us on exactly how they obtain the genetic information, because that's the threshold question. You know, when American companies are being purchased, there's the CFIUS uh, uh, process that addresses the purchase of American companies. But the purchasing and export of the data itself is totally unregulated, which is why I feel so strongly about this legislation. And so if, Mr. Evening, in the next week or so, you could give us more information on how they actually go about doing it. Um, question uh, for you, uh, Ms. Puglisi. It's clear that the American government has been forcing the transfer of a number of valuable American innovations through legal acquisitions and illicit tactics. Another legislative initiative I'm pushing would require companies doing business in China to report on technology and IP transfers. In your view, wouldn't this requirement help the U.S. government get a better sense of the problem and allow for our government, as we try to put together an all-of-government response, come up with a better approach? So I think that really gets at that transparency issue and understanding. Um, I think 